Don't go nowhere. Don't go nowhere. Just stay right where you at. You ain't even got to take a seat. Just stand up for a minute. Turn with me in Genesis chapter 8. Just real quick. Real quick, real quick. Hey, Mike, give me that towel. Let me tell y'all, everybody ought to bring one of these. They ought to prophesy to yourself. This is how I'm going to get nasty. That's what you ought to do. Just go ahead and plan like I do. Just bring one. Just bring one. I got a few right here. I got a few witnesses. Just bring one. That right there, put, that puts the pressure on you. When I bring that, I got to use it. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 8, 15 through 21 is where I'm going to go real quick. Watch. It says this. We've been in this series preparing for rain, been preaching on Noah, on the ark. It says in verse 15 of chapter 8, Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife, your sons and your sons' wives with you. Aren't you glad you're getting out of the ark? I mean, it's been a minute. Hallelujah. He said, No, go on out the ark. Carry everybody with you. Bring out of you every living thing of all flesh that's with you. Birds and cattle. Every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. God didn't send them out without an assignment. That He said, there's a, great, there's a grace on you to be fruitful and multiply when you walk out of the ark. You walking out a different way than you walked in. You struggled to multiply before you walked in the yard. You struggled to be fruitful before you walked in the yard. You struggled trying to make light in dark places before you went in the yard. But I'm calling you out of the yard, and there is a grace upon your life. Hallelujah. That when you get out, ah, yeah, there will be a grace on your life to be fruitful and multiply. So Noah went out. And his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, whatever creeps on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord (laughs) and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Everybody say soothing aroma. It smelled good to God. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Oh, no, 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 no. No, see, we've missed this for so long because we think that he said never again will I flood the earth. He said never again will I curse the ground. I will not cause man to be unfruitful in the earth, but I will break open the ground. I will break open the ground. I'll never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. Let me share this with you for a minute. It just, I mean, it just, when I read this weeks ago, it just pierced me. When Noah came out of the ark, He built an altar. You would think somebody that had been in an ark for six months would have a lot of other things they wanted to do. He didn't build a home. He didn't smell the grass. Somebody with me. He didn't go looking for food nowhere. He didn't cook a meal so everybody could eat. He didn't run all the animals out because he said, I'm tired of being around you. Noah went straight to a place and built an altar. He came straight out of the ark and built an altar. Straight out of the ark and built an altar. I heard about three weeks into the quarantine, not from getting out of it, I heard about three weeks into it. God told me very plain one day in here on Sunday morning that the day you come back, it'll be a day of worship. I didn't even know I was going to preach on Noah at that point. I've been preaching on Noah five weeks. We started Noah the week after God said that to me. 
He said, the day you come back, it'll be a day of worship. And God has just matriculated this process and in this series to arrive us at the day that we come upon the day of Pentecost where we're getting out of the ark and it's the day we have an opportunity to worship. Hallelujah. Watch, 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 watch. He said in verse 20, in verse 20 of, of, of chapter 8, it said, Noah take every, he took every clean animal and bird and he made a sacrifice on the altar. I pondered this and really was perplexed over it for a little bit. Here's animals that were brought into the ark and made it all the way through the flood. Only for the day that the door to the ark would open, they would be put on an altar. Man, I just really sat back on that for a minute. I'm like, God, you saved animals just to kill them. And he had me go back, and I looked in Genesis chapter 6. Watch this. Genesis chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. God said this. He said, He said, Of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female of the birds of their kind, the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing on the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. But then he changed it up in chapter 7. In verse 2 and 3 of chapter 7, he said, Take with you seven of every clean animal, male and his female, to each of the animals that are unclean, male and his female, also seven of each birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the... To keep things alive bring in what's righteous to keep things alive take two of every unclean thing they'll remain but bring in seven of everything that's righteous to keep everything alive watch 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 here watch watch y'all see what they did to me today Y'all see these shirts? They had these shirts made. I didn't even know it. They, they, they're profiting off my name. I, can I tell you why I say watch? Because the Word of God lives. It lives. You with me? You with me? It ain't just something you hear. It lives. It lives. Hallelujah. If you want to show somebody something that lives, you carry them to see it. Hallelujah. I know when people were being resurrected, people were grabbing folk, saying, come here and see this thing that lives. That's why I tell you to watch. The word lives. Then he told him, Take two of the unclean, seven of every clean, for Noah only to take those clean animals out of the ark and put them on an altar. Why keep them that whole time? Why preserve them through the flood just to kill them? And God said it was a setup. He said it was a setup. God was preparing man's ability to thrive. Before they ever went in. God had already equipped man to succeed before he ever went into the ark. He was walking around in an environment of darkness. In an environment of struggle. In an environment of oppression. In an environment of death. In an environment of anger and bitterness and wrath. But God said even though your environment looks sick, the ability to live is still in you. Jesus. God said, I've given you everything you need going into the ark to exit into your new season. I have equipped you with everything you need for a new season. I'm talking to somebody prophetically right now. He said, I have, give, I have equipped you with everything you need 
to thrive. Let me tell you something. You need to hear this right now because we've been in a, in a, in a time period of nothing but death around us. Whether somebody's dying by a virus, somebody else is dying because somebody else is ignorance. But we got nothing but death around us right now. And it would seem that that would be the overarching theme of where we live and the nation we live in and the world we live in. But can I tell you, as long as God has still got you in it, there's still the ability to thrive. The world may be going stupid, but God said, I'm going to hide a few people in the ark and I'm going to give them everything they need to succeed. He said, I was setting them up, giving them everything they needed for their new dimension, for their new season, for their new opportunity. He said, because they came out of the ark with everything they ever needed to worship. He said, I'll feed you for the rest of your life based on your worship. I'll cause the environment to provide for you just based on your ability to worship. Oh, man, I ain't. I'll cause the land to be fruitful just because of your ability to worship. You might have wondered what it was going to look like when you come out of the yard. You might have wondered how that job was going to pick back up and go back to making money the way you were. You might have wondered how you were going to pay your bills. You might have wondered, am I going to get sick? Is something going to be wrong with my... You might have wondered, can I walk down the street and somebody not take my... You might have wondered a lot of things. But he said, your ability to thrive is not outside of you, it's inside of you. I've already given you everything you need. God set a standard in this moment. He said, you always have what you need to shift things from death to life. You always have what you need to shift things from lack to provision. You always have what you need to move things from despair to hope. Yes. This is a word for the church. Don't look around you. Look in you. Yes. I didn't mean to make this no race message, but let me just say this here. If you got any root of bitterness or divisiveness in your heart, let me tell you something. We've never been given the tools growing up of how to overcome that. We've only been given the tools to feed it. But everything you need to thrive is already in you. And you may not feel like worshiping beside somebody that looks like this. But you ain't worshiping her. You're not even worshiping you. If you can find it inside of you to begin to lift your voice and your hands to the Almighty God, it will drive out every bit of death on the inside of your life. You've already got everything you need to survive. You've already got everything you need to thrive. He said, I was setting a standard for humanity that they'll always have what they need to create a shift. When you realize all you got right now is all you need. When you realize all you got is all you'll ever need at any moment just to worship. God has carried us into a place over the last three months that we have learned very quickly We have no control in and of ourselves. We have no ability to change anything in and of ourselves. We can be locked down in a moment if it was left up to us.
But he said, regardless, regardless of the situation, the circumstance, three months from now when you're on your job and you feel like you're locked down, three weeks from now when you're dealing with a marriage issue, you have in that moment all you need to create a shift. I know it may seem odd, but it would change, it would literally change the temperature of the environment if instead of complaining about your issue, you just got down on your knees and began to worship. God, I know right now she's frustrated with me and I want to snap back, but God, I just worship your name. God, I know right now tensions are high and I really want to clap back with my anger on social media. But right now, all I'm going to do is drop down in the middle of my, uh, of my bedroom and just begin to worship. Because all you ever need to create a shift has already been prepared in you. And you realize that your fruit will come out of your worship. He told him in chapter 9, he told man, he said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and have dominion over it. But he did not decree that over their life until they built an altar to worship. The fruit of your life will come out of your worship. And I swear to goodness, if the church ever loses their ability to worship again, we better get our minds right, our hearts right. You better lose all of your dignity. You better lose all of your pride. You better lose all of your inhibitions. You better lose all of your worry. You better lose everything you're concerned about. Anybody looking at you or thinking about you, and you better find yourself in a personal place, an intimate place of worship. Because your freedom will come out of your worship. Noah walked into a whole new world out of his ability to worship. Your ability not only to affect your presence. Can I just tell you right now that we can have conversations and we will. We can bring divisive subjects together and begin to have, have talks about things. And we will. But won't nothing change anything but worship. Your ability to create freedom in your environment is inside of you. You wonder, I can't make a difference. I can't make it. Yes, you can. Because your worship is loud. And your worship is powerful. And your worship is mighty. And your worship has dominion. And your worship has a grace. It has the ability to shift things for the multitudes. If you don't believe me, watch. The ability to affect your present circumstance and your environment. And not only that, but the city. The people of the city. The people that will come after you in this region. Can be changed by what's in you. Chapter 8. Verse 21 again said, And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma and then said, Never again. One man had it in his heart to leave out of that ark and do nothing but worship. And God began to smell his worship and said, never again. I'm not just talking about your environment. I'm talking about your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and the cities that will rise up out of you. Never again. Never again. Never again will I curse the ground because I've seen your worship. I still didn't know when I put you in the ark. I still had to trust that you would seek me. I still had to trust that your heart would be set apart differently from those that I had to push away. But now that you've come out of that ark, and the first thing you did was worship. Watch. 
He said, never again, never again will I curse anything around you because I've seen what's in you. Never again. The Lord smelled a soothing aroma and said, never again. And I'm here to tell you that a few that will manifest a passion to worship will change things for the multitudes. God didn't need 8,000 in that boat. He needed eight. Hey, let's just be real about it for a minute because we don't learn about Shem and Ham and Japheth until after he calls Noah. The truth of the matter really is is that God didn't need but one. He said he smelled a soothing aroma. I'm going to shut it down right here with this. I want you to watch. The word soothing here, I, I just begin to look at that. And the word, the word soothing there is the word nikoak, and it actually comes out of the word nuwak. And the word nuwak means to rest. It actually means to tranquilize or to rest. And here's what you got to understand. It says that God rested on the aroma. God rested on the aroma of something man did. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me. Something that happened in the earth had the ability to affect heaven. God rested because of man's worship. It brought God peace when man began to worship. It brought God tranquility when man began to worship. Noah worshiped. God rested. And I'm like, whoa, this is, this is significant. Because in chapter 8, the Bible says that the water separated. And the land began to appear. And the animals made their way onto the land. And then man made his way onto the land. And then man worshiped. And God rested. If you go to Genesis chapter 2, last week I began to bring a relationship between what took place in the ark and what took place in Genesis chapter 1. But if you go to Genesis chapter 2 and you begin to read at verse 1 through 3, watch what it says. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day. And he sanctified it. Because in it, he rested. In it, he rested. And I got to thinking, I said, God, what allowed you to rest on the seventh day? He said, because man was dropped out of the ark on the 6th. God, what, what, what allows you to rest? On, he said, because man began to worship me the moment he set foot on the ground. He had the whole earth in front of him, but he began to walk in worship. Hallelujah. He had the ability to command the ground, but he began to walk out of the ark in an attitude and a heart of worship. He gave his life to be a lifestyle of worship. He gave his life to edify me. He gave his life to be righteous before me. He gave himself. He walked out of the ark and had everything he needed. To worship the fruitfulness of the earth comes out of the rest of God
anybody get that? Watch. The earth has lacked fruit because God's had to pick back working again. Why? Not because the world, but because the people in the yard forgot what was in them. The world's going to be the world, but the people in the yard better know that everything they need to bring God rest and fruit in the earth is already inside of them. God said, I've created a reset. I've set you in three months of silence. I've put you in the ark in order to change everything and create a shift. Now what will you do? If it could be so, I, 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 I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, I just want to rest. I just want to rest. Not that God gets tired, but that God's optimal environment is worship. You ever had to go and just fix something all the time for your kid and they wouldn't ever grow up enough to get it themselves? You had junk right in your own home, but you had to keep going to theirs to get things right. I ain't getting no help. Somebody with me. Your stuff was okay, and you just thought, man, if that boy could just get it right now, I'd be, I'd be able to sit and rest and enjoy what I've worked for. But you got to keep getting up out of your easy chair and going and fixing crap for them. God said it. I got heaven right. It's always worshiping. I don't even need that many in the earth if I can just find eight. If I can just find this one little house in Anderson that will understand what it means to worship me. I won't need all of Anderson to do it. I'll just, just give me one place. Just give me one place I can build a boat with. Just give me one place. Just give me a few people that understand what it means to look inside of themselves and begin to worship me with everything they have. Hallelujah. That will bring me rest. And so here's what I know. God wants to rest. What are you going to do? 